On Larry King Now, famed baseball agent and insurance guru, Dennis Gilbert. Was there a moment, with all your sports background, when you knew you had a knack for financial things, like insurance and other things? No, no. Uh, but I sure had to learn it, and I sure had to study it. I probably studied twice as hard. I was scared out of my mind when I got out of baseball. I didn't know what I was going to do. Bobby Bonilla, are they still paying him? They'll be paying him for a total of 25 years, 1.19 million, every July 1st, from age 40 to 65. How did you sell that to the Wilpons? Well, I didn't sell it to them. They wanted a little bit of relief. I had an insurance background, and we figured out how to defer the money. Plus, does everyone need life insurance? You need life insurance if you love somebody, either yourself or somebody else. If you love yourself, life insurance is just a way to save money. And if you love somebody else, it's protection for them. So that's everybody. That's right. All next on Larry King Now. Welcome to Larry King Now. Today's guest is the CEO and founder of the Gilbert Group, Dennis Gilbert. He's my personal friend, a great guy, and he specializes in developing life insurance policies and wealth protection for a resume of clients in sports, entertainment, and business. He also made his mark on Major League Baseball, negotiating over 1,000 contracts for players like Bobby Bonilla and Barry Bonds, Jose Canseco, and Mike Piazza. In addition to his work with the Gilbert Group, Dennis serves as the co-founder and chairman of the Professional Baseball Scouts Foundation, and he's also a special assistant to the Chicago White Sox owner, Chairman Jerry Reinsdorf. Thanks so much. Before we get jump into insurance trends and topics, you, you were a minor league baseball player. Not a very good one. How far did you get? I got it far enough to where they said I got released not once or twice, but three times. In what chain? Uh, first it was the Red Sox chain, then the Mets chain, and finally in the Mexican League. All right, why didn't you make it? What it, held you back? You were very fast. And I could hit. In fact, I was known as a three-tool player at the time. Three tools. Yeah, I could hit and I could run and I could talk. What couldn't you do? I couldn't, didn't throw or field very well. So you have to catch the ball. Well, today you'd be a DH. Yeah, but they didn't have that in those days. Do you think you'd have made it as a DH? I think I would have made it as a, as a player today. When I played, there were only eight teams in each league and very few minor league clubs. And there were a lot of people. I mean, we had a lot of bodies in our camps. So people, whether they hit or whether they did well, uh, I compare myself to some of the players today. I thought I would have been as good or better than some of them. Go, go Gilbert, right? Was there a moment, with all your sports background, when you knew you had a knack for financial things, like insurance and other things? No, no. Uh, but I sure had to learn it. And I sure had to study it. I probably studied twice as hard. I was scared out of my mind when I got out of baseball. I didn't know what I was going to do. Why did you get out? I got out of baseball because, like I said, they released me. And I didn't have a background to really stay in the game. I tried coaching. And there's really not a lot of money in coaching. So back how did you day. become an agent? Well, I was an insurance person first. Oh, insurance first, then agent. I was an insurance person, then simultaneously I was an agent. I ran both companies at the same time. So you'd represent athletes and also sell people insurance? I did. I was going 24-7. Well, that's, that seems incredible. How, how, did, that, how did you get into... How did, tell me, give me a little history. How did you get into insurance and then into baseball and then doing both? I was coaching baseball over at Los Angeles City College. And what had happened was the first baseman's father 
would come to practice all the time, and he's driving a Cadillac, and I was driving a Dodge van. And one day I asked him, what do you do? And he said, I sell insurance. And I go, what's that? And he said, come have lunch with me. And that's how I got into the insurance business. And then kept being an agent. No, I wasn't an agent at all at that time. I became an agent about eight or nine years later. What took you into that? Two of my former teammates were, the, were Brett brothers. One was John Brett, one was Ken Brett. And their brother, Bobby Brett, they were all insurance clients, as well as George Brett. And one day, George called me up and said, my brother's having trouble with Ewing Kaufman, who was, at that point was the owner of the Kansas City Royals. And he asked if I could help out with his contract. And I said, sure. That started it. That started it. What did you enjoy more? Well, for different periods, I enjoyed selling insurance. And different periods, I enjoyed negotiating baseball contracts. One's really a passion more than a business. The agent business is more of a passion. But it's blown up now. Or these guys make a lot of money. Oh, I know. I'll have more with insurance expert Dennis Gilbert right after this. Well, you must have done well if you, you negotiated. For example, you helped negotiate a contract for players that paid out Bobby Bonilla. Are they still paying him? They'll be paying him for a total of 25 years, $1.19 million, every July 1st from age 40 to 65. How did you sell that to the Wilpons? Well, I didn't sell it to them. They wanted a little bit of relief. I had an insurance background, and we figured out how to defer the money. At that time, unfortunately, they were, they were getting their monies, or they were investing their monies with Madoff. <laughs> and that didn't work out real well, but because of the returns they were getting, they thought they would arbitrage by guaranteeing me 8%, and they were getting 16 I mean, that had to be negotiated. I mean, they didn't just throw out, we're going to do this. So Bobby Bonilla gets $1 million every July 1st. $1.19 million. $1.19. For how many more years? I think about another 15 years. <laughs> Bobby must appreciate you a lot. We're good friends. Was that beneficial to the owners? It would have been if Madoff uh, was real. Yeah. Should players take out injury insurance? You mean disability type yeah. of? Mm -hmm. Of course they should. I mean, everybody should take, you know, for whatever professional person that relies on their, their mind or their body or their health should have insurance on their on themselves. In other words, you buy insurance on your car, you buy insurance on your home, you buy insurance on just about everything. Uh, and if you had a machine, if you owned a machine in your backyard and that machine printed money, you'd buy insurance on that machine, wouldn't you? Yeah. Well, you're that machine. So you, of course you would you buy insurance on yourself. In case you got sick or injured. All right. What is it? Did you have a favorite client over all these years? I, I probably did. I mean, I had a lot of people that were my favorite. They were like my kids. Barry Bonds was very close with you. Oh, I love Barry Bonds. I loved uh, Saber Hagen, George Brett. I loved Joe McGrann. I loved all these guys. Should Bonds be in the Hall of Fame? I think so. Me too. You're still involved with Major League Baseball. I am. You work with the White Sox in what capacity? Are you a busy guy? I am. What do you do for Jerry Reinsdorf? Anything Jerry wants me to do. I consult mostly, do a little bit of scouting, a little bit of negotiating contracts, a little bit of analysis on player contracts. Uh, and from time to time, I'll look at a player and just give opinions on trades. Wasn't it hard to negotiate? You're negotiating for the owner when you used to negotiate for the player. Different players. So does that make you give a better understanding? You're on both sides of the desk. It does. It does. 
I mean, I'm sensitive to both sides. That's what made me, I consider, or at least a good agent, because I rode the buses. I understand what it took to get there. I mean, I understand the sacrifices these kids make to get to the major leagues. It's not just having all this great ability. It takes an awful lot of work. You know, you sacrifice an awful lot every weekend. Well, some kids go to the beach. Some kids take summer vacations. You don't get summer vacations if you're a baseball player. You play on summer teams and your teammates rely on you to be there. So you have to be there because you're among the better players. What makes a good agent? The passion for the player, passion to make sure that he's taken care of appropriate, physically, financially, and morally. So what attributes do you look for? Something just... for, as an agent? Yeah. Well, if, knowledge of the game. I think that's the first thing. Knowledge of... of the things you need to do to, let's say, negotiate the appropriate contract. Why do agents specialize it? You did baseball. Uh, Correct. Bob Wolf, my first agent, he did everything. Hockey, baseball, football, basketball. But I notice now a lot of just specializing. Well, I specialize in baseball because that was my passion. I, had a, I knew baseball really well. I had my insurance practice and really had very little interest in football or basketball or hockey. When we return, my conversation with the CEO of the Gilbert Group, Dennis Gilbert, continues. All right, you specialize, I guess it's Dennis Gilbert of the Gilbert Group, probably the best known insurance group in Southern California. He's also my dear friend. He also sold me my policy, which means he'll deliver when I go up there. He will deliver the envelope. You deliver right away, don't you? We do. How fast after someone dies? I would say within a week after we get the death claim. Okay, you specialize in life insurance and wealth protection. What does that mean? That means that some people say, well, I self-insure. And that statement alone really makes no sense at all. In other words... Uh, when you're talking like in today's economy and somebody is lucky enough to be successful and they've created an estate or spent 20, 30, 40 years to create it, you know, if they pass under current law, you can pay as much as 40% of everything you own or your heirs will pay as much as 40% of what they own to the government and estate taxes. There have been sports teams that have been lost, real estate that's been lost because a family had to sell it to pay these taxes. There's no tax on insurance, right? Uh, well, there is there is tax if it's not set up appropriately. But the, the beneficiary of a life insurance policy doesn't have to pay tax on that benefit. They don't pay income tax, but what they do pay if you own your policy, it's in your estate and it's included in your estate and you have to pay estate taxes. That's why it's set up in trust. Do you only deal with well-off people? No. No, I deal with anybody who has a need for insurance that I come across. Does everyone need life insurance? You need life insurance if you love somebody, either yourself or somebody else. If you love yourself, Life insurance is just a way to save money. And if you love somebody else, uh, it's protection for them. So that's everybody. That's right. Life insurance is only life insurance if somebody dies. If they live, it's a great way to save money. Is it true that when you buy life insurance, the company is betting you will live and you are betting you will die? Not entirely. Not in some of the products that they have today. Like uh, I was alluding to in our conversation a couple of days ago, I was telling you about the policies that are tied to the index fund. They have policies that give you, like, in, like as you know recently, the stock market's been a little crazy. It's, you know, it's gone down before it was going up. And you never really know what's going to happen in 2008. 
I think the index, the S&P lost 37%. What did that mean to the insurance policy holder? Well, if somebody's investing in the, or has an estate and they lose one third of all their assets or all their investments and they want to pass their, th their money along, I mean, that's a third less or more than a third less. Now, if they have one of these index insurance policies and they have their investments in that, they have a floor in that policy. The floor could be zero, one, or two percent, depending on what company you buy. But for that, you pay a price. You have a cap on the amount of rate of return you get. The return would, could only be 10, 11, or 12 percent. What do most people get wrong about buying insurance? They buy it from somebody who's a short timer, somebody who hasn't been in the business. Your over. uncle. Yeah, or, or, and somebody who really, they stick their toe in it and then they're out of the business and nobody's really watching the policy to make sure it's performing the way it was supposed to perform. What's the biggest grievance against the industry? The biggest is people tell the truth, but they don't tell the whole truth. They don't tell the whole story about what really could happen if the policy doesn't perform. And that's why ins life insurance really needs to be looked at really often. In other words, like if, you have, if your policy is tied to uh, the bond market, like most policies are, uh, and bonds haven't been performing, then your life insurance, instead of going to as long as you live, uh, could be, could just stop performing and they could double or triple your rates or your policy would, you could lose your policy. Do you recommend young people taking out insurance early when the premiums are low? Not only that, but, I, but that ensures their insurability. In other words, it locks in not only their age, but also their health. When, when people get older, sometimes they get on medication or they have something going on with them. And so instead of being able to get a preferred contract, they may have to pay for an excess charge. So in other words, if you're 25 years old and you're just starting, take out a smaller policy, then enlarge it. That's right. While you're healthy and then that, that's always in, in place. I tell people to pay themselves first before they pay anybody else. Our final moments with my friend, the CEO of the Gilbert Group, Dennis Gilbert, right after this. Growing concern for many Americans is long-term care insurance. The Wall Street Journal recently wrote, Now, though the industry is in financial turmoil, causing misery for many of 7.3 million people who own a long-term care policy equal to about a fifth of the United States population, at least 65 years old, steep rate increases that many policyholders never saw coming are confronting them with an awful choice come up with the money to pay more or walk away from their coverage? Well, the article isn't quite written that way or, or shouldn't have been written that way. What they could do is they could reduce their coverage to keep the, the rates down, but that's not really the answer. The real answer is, is that buying standalone long-term care insurance probably wasn't the most appropriate way to buy insurance in the first place unless you could afford to buy a paid up policy where you have no further premiums. So what I recommend to my clients that want to buy long-term care is they buy it as a writer on their life insurance and that way they lock in their premium so the rates don't go up. I've seen many, many people buying long-term care insurance and at a time that they most likely will have claims, they have to drop it because the premiums become too high. How do you know whether to go to New York Life or Mass Mutual or Prudential or you see all these commercials? How do you know what insurance company to pick? That's a great question. And the real answer is you don't. The re no, the real answer is, is you get an agent who is independent. Uh, I was with some of those companies and those companies really give the agent incentive to sell their product. In other words, they'll pay for your rent, they'll pay for your secretaries, your phone bills, your parking and all that. So you've got agents that really, really push that product 
when it's not appropriate. So and if you have an independent agent, you choose the best policy for that person. The independent agent. So uh, like how many different companies will you deal with? I'm licensed with about 60 of them. 60? Six zero, and we shop everything. Different policies are competitive at different ages. Uh, you know, some policies are, are better for people, let's say, or they'll give a better rate for somebody with a heart condition, or somebody with diabetics, overweight, uh, hepatitis. Any, everything should be shopped around. So when I see a commercial for a company, I shouldn't call that company. I wouldn't. After. Contact an independent agent. That's correct. I've been doing this 43 years. And when you're dealing with somebody who's an employee of a company, uh, you're not going to get you know, your, your best numbers. Is insurance always a good place? Is it an industry that's always in good shape? Well, some companies are better off than other companies. Some companies had real problems, had some real problems, and had to raise their premiums, and people were counting on those premiums. Also, a lot of people rely on stockbrokers, which is a terrible idea to buy insurance from, and banks, which is even a worse place to buy insurance from. These guys know very, very little about the life insurance industry, what companies are the best, how to shop, how to help somebody take a policy that may be rated and not rated. They should go to somebody that does life insurance, not to a banker or a stockbroker or somebody who says he's a financial expert. States control insurance very strongly, don't they? They do. As well they should, right? As well they should. By the way, does Trump new tax plan affect insurance? It, there's good and bad. The good is it, it affects the country in a good way as far as the estate tax laws. In other words, they double the exemptions. Uh, somebody who used to have a 5.40 exemption before, or $5,450,000 exemption before they had to pay estate taxes, it's now double, $11 million before there are any estate taxes, or for a married couple. It's double that. Uh, the part that helps insurance companies, it makes life insurance policies way more competitive as an investment, is that you can get tax-free income by using the cash values in the policy as deferred compensation. So the independent agent shops for me, right? That's true. I go to him or her and they do the shopping. That's correct. Can they often come back and say there are three different policies here? We can choose one of the three? Well, you pay, he's making a commission to pick the one that's best for you. Or best for him. Well, if he does that, he does that. I mean, it depends. You have to shop agents. You see? How do you do that? Uh, you can go online. You can see what his reputation is. You can see how long he's been in the business. You see what his, his credentials are, who he done business with. I mean, uh, in today's world, you know, between Google and, and, and everything else, you, you have an idea who's good, who's not good, how many complaints, how many lawsuits he's been in. What, do you know what percentage of Americans are insured for their life? I do not. What would you guess? I couldn't tell you. I wouldn't, I wouldn't guess. I would tell you that uh, you like to see as many as possible. I know in the Scouts Foundation, which you, which you know about, a lot of the Scouts, they were told to buy term insurance by financial advisors. Term is temporary insurance. It runs out. When it runs out, these people are, are not covered. You know, insurance companies are not stupid. They're really smart. That's why they make the loans to all these big buildings and all these skyscrapers. And, and They get a lot of money. They get it from term insurance. You know that, believe it or not, that, that and this is a great statistic, I heard that 98% of all term insurance gets canceled before death. So what were you buying? Protection just for that? For periods of time. 
and you know the insurance companies are clipping coupons. Dennis, you're a great guy. I'm proud to be associated with you. I love you, Larry. You're my favorite. I love you too. Big thanks to my guest and friend Dennis Gilbert. He knows his business. CEO and founder of the Gilbert Group. As always, you can find me on Twitter at Kings Things, and I'll see you next time.